It's hard to grasp the apocalyptic impact of the 1917 revolutions in Russia. They shook the country and the lives of everyone in it. Russia was ditching the certainties of a thousand years. The future was up for grabs, terrifying or exhilarating, with no rules, no guidelines and no guarantees. Writers, artists and musicians faced big decisions. They could stay and cheer the brave new world. They could snipe at it or they could flee. And as it turned out, not many choices guaranteed a happy ending. In this concert, we'll hear from three composers who took different paths. The most familiar, Sergei Prokofiev, had left Russia in the wake of the October Revolution and wrote his dazzling lyrical third piano concerto in Paris. He could have stayed there, but Stalin enticed him back to perform it in Moscow. When he came in 1927, the Kremlin showered him with flattery and promises. Already nostalgic for his homeland, Prokofiev returned definitively to Soviet Russia in 1936. Prokofiev's son Sviatoslav, who was 11 at the time, told me that he remembered the train journey and his father's excitement. He was homesick, he believed the promises, he naively thought he could stay out of the politics, said Sviatoslav. At first he said his father was happy, then his friends and eventually his wife began to be arrested and sent to the Gulag. The experience of the composer Alexander Masalov illustrates another side of the dilemma faced by artists under Stalin. Masalov wrote his most famous work, The Iron Foundry, as a hymn of praise to Stalin's industrialization program. It's a splendid piece of socialist bombast, all jagged rhythms and musical onomatopoeia, premiered in 1927 as Stalin was about to launch his first five-year plan. The surging energy of those years, the frantic drive to modernise Soviet industry, made machines and technology favoured subjects for music and art. But Musilov didn't get the thanks he might have expected. His music was attacked as too Western, too focused on machines instead of heroic workers. He wrote to Stalin, asking for permission to emigrate. He didn't get it. In 1937, he too was sent to the Gulag. The problem for composers is that they knew they had to write socialist realist music, but no one quite knew what that meant. It was clear if a novel or a painting was socialist, you could read the words or check how heroically Stalin was painted, but music was nebulous. The Kremlin said it should embody ideology, party-mindedness and the spirit of the people, but Stalin and his officials kept changing their minds. One composer who did negotiate the unpredictable hurdles and moving goalposts of socialist realism was Reinhold Glier. He understood that the Bolshevik leadership were cultural conservatives who liked tuneful, accessible music. And he was willing to provide it. Just tell us what to write, he's reported to have told one official meeting. Glier's music is hardly groundbreaking, but it is tuneful and at times beautiful. His 1943 Concerto for Coloratura Soprano treats the human voice as an orchestral instrument. As in Rachmaninoff's Vocalese, written 30 years earlier, there are no words. But the evolving mood, from the sombre opening to the joyful finale, met the wartime need for optimism and won Glier a Stalin Prize. The composer lived into his 80s and died peacefully in his bed.